Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, dear Anna Wilbeek, uh, dear partner of Anna, Paul, uh, and family of, uh, of Anna, dear friends, colleagues, uh, professors from Maastricht, and especially the professors who came uh, from elsewhere. Thank you all uh, for being here. Um, and also a warm welcome to all the other audience here in the room uh, and those who are joining us online. This is a streamed event. Um, thank you for making the effort of, uh, of joining us here today. It's always a pleasure um, uh, to end an intense working day and working week on a high note uh, with a festival activity such as this. My name is uh, Ralph Peters. I'm uh, the Vice Dean of Research of the Faculty of Science and Engineering, and uh, today I'm acting as the Pro-Rector to uh, guide you through this ceremony. That means I'm replacing uh, the Rector of the University, Professor Pamela Habibovic, and also the Dean of our Faculty, uh, who both could not attend. The Dean is uh, Professor Thomas Clay, and they are sending uh, you their congratulations. Um, before I give the floor to Anna, it's my pleasure to share a few details about her and her chair. Um, and I had to ask around a bit to, uh, to see what exactly uh, she has been interacting already with people uh, in the department and in, in the other locations that uh, our department is active. Anna came to uh, Maastricht at the end of uh, the summer of 2020. Um, to take up uh, this new chair on the topic of data fusion and intelligent interaction at the Faculty of Science and Engineering. And before she came here, her academic journey took her from Warsaw in Poland, where she studied at the Warsaw uh, University of Technology, and then completed her PhD degree uh, at the Polish Academy, academy of Sciences. Um, and then that journey took her to a postdoc year at the University of Missouri in uh, Columbia, Missouri and then back to Warsaw, and then she went for seven years to Eindhoven. So you will also see some people from Eindhoven today in the cortege. Um, I'm not going to read her full CV today, be, um, uh, be assured, but you will understand that she has an excellent reputation um, in research and education, and that she's also very well internationally networked and recognized. Um, Anna's chair uh, is embedded in our faculty within the Department of Advanced Computing Sciences. And it may be interesting to know that this is strategically uh, positioned as um, one of currently two chairs funded by the, um, the sector plan uh, of computer science. One key role for this chair is to uh, foster collaborations with other academic research parties, uh, but also with parties in business and industry and society outside of Maastricht um, uh, and in the wider uh, region. And obviously this was not an easy task for Anna to get started on uh, because she came here in the middle of the corona pandemic with all the restrictions in place. Um, but nevertheless, she was remarkably successful and uh, with all her enthusiasm and uh, energy to um, establish many, many contacts in a short time. So next to her activities in Maastricht, um, I think she now has made links to all the four Brightland campuses. So Maastricht is one of those. Uh, but she's also active on the uh, Smart Services campus, um, where there's the Institute of uh, BIS, where she is uh, working as a PI for a day in a week. Um, and she has quite a few contacts on the Camelot campus, where she's cooperating. And uh, some of those are also joining on the cortege uh, today. And I think there's also connections to Venlo. And I already saw some representatives of Venlo as well. Um, so that is already uh, very remarkable uh, to make all these connections. And I don't think there are many professors uh, who actually are active on all the campuses. Um, the chair of Data Fusion and Intelligent Interactions allows for all these connections, I would say, in a rather natural way. Data has become available uh, to businesses and to hospitals, companies and institutions in increased uh, amounts. And there's a strong opportunity nowadays to leverage that data in the best possible way, uh, to make um, the, the best sorts of uh, decision making of all kinds. Um, and knowing how to bring data safely together through data fusion and how to model it with AI, uh, as Anna is doing, and how to keep humans in the loop uh, that puts one in an excellent position, actually, to uh, contribute to this field and to establish all these uh, contacts and to improve the state of the art. 
And Anna is doing precisely that. And I'm sure she's going to entertain us today with uh, many examples in her uh, presentation. Of course, you also need to have the right personality for this. And uh, as Anna and I are working in the same department, uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, getting to know her a bit over the past four years and I've noticed how her personality is actually perfectly fitting this human in the loop as well as the fusion topic uh, of her chair in many different ways. So uh, let me illustrate this with a few uh, anecdotes and examples. Um, first of all, Anna is of course, uh, those who know her always, and I mean always, in a good mood. and. Uh, bringing energy to events and to meetings. Um, and uh, these meetings, uh, we might have in English or in Dutch. So it's always a very dynamic setting that we're active in. And I would characterize her in Dutch as a mensen mens. And indeed, uh, she also told me at some point that she loves to spoil her nephews and uh, nieces uh, whenever she can. So uh, the family uh, can take that to heart and uh, use that. Um, and her activities and her hobbies, she's also fusing a, a wide range of diverse things. Uh, for instance, look at the sports she is practicing. Uh, she likes to go for skiing once in a while, but she's also doing scuba diving. Um, not sure if there are many in the audience who uh, also do that, but uh, that, that is a nice characteristic trait of, uh, of Anna. And then with a partner, they like to travel to uh, many different cities, uh, I heard, and, uh, and to experience the other cultures and the exotic impressions. So um, maybe as a last thing, rumors in the department are that Anna is also the go-to person for mixing cocktails. Uh, so what kind of personality would fit better? So I don't think we could wish for a better person to uh, fit the data fusion topic. So I guess it's time to... Uh, announce the title of today's inauguration, The Real Value of Data, A Matter of Fusion and Diffusion. Uh, and I hope you're all ready for takeoff and uh, will enjoy this Friday afternoon. Anna Wilbeek, the floor is yours. Dear Prorector, pro Dear family, friends, and colleagues, the real value of uh, data is in fusion and uh, diffusion. You already know this, as you have read the title of uh, this presentation, I hope. But uh, let me explain this a bit further, nevertheless. In uh, 2006, the famous British uh, mathematician and um, enter entrepreneur Cliff Humbly said, data is the new oil, and uh, as oil was the main driver for the old economy. And indeed, we can see that many companies and organizations are collecting more and more uh, data to support their decision making offer better products and or services to their customers and gain competitive advantage. Let me give a few examples from two domains. For instance, in the manufacturing domains, uh, com co uh, companies are experimenting with uh, predictive maintenance to predict when uh, equipment failures may occur. This will enable them to optimize maintenance schedules, be more uh, reliable and reduce cost of unplanned downtown or unnecessary repairs. Moreover, those companies are trying to use data proactively to improve uh, and monitor product quality, which means no more, no more faulty products. What a huge saving of money and reduction of waste. Let's move now to healthcare domain. Here we can see that uh, data can make a huge change. It's not only about making diagnosis, although an app in your phone can better predict than your GP whether a change on your skin is strange more is a cancer or not. Pharmaceutical companies can leverage data analytics to streamline the drug discovery and development process. 
by analyzing biological data, clinical test results, and real-world evidence, researchers can identify potential drug targets, optimize clinical trials designs, and accelerate the development of new therapies. These applications of data processing from these domains are just a few examples from the ocean of possibilities across all application domains. As a consequence, we are dealing more and more with, uh, uh, we are collecting more and more uh, data. How much? You can see it on, in the figure on the slide. Apparently, 90% of all global data has been created in the last two years. As you can see, the data growth is, uh, clearly follows an exponential curve. So it is expected that even uh, more data will be collected in the future. However, even though we collect uh, all those data, we don't use them to their fullest potential. In many companies, the data are stored in uh, several isolated systems. Companies have, been, um, uh, have between tens and hundreds of independent systems, and sometimes even more. Consider, for example, a car factory that has uh, installed sensors in the production line robots, but it's not actively collecting the sensor measurements. So if you would like to predict a robot's failure, first you would have to manually collect uh, those measurements, organize them, and only then train an AI model to predict problems with the robot. In many companies, production schedules and maintenance schedules are not synchronized, as production and maintenance are responsibilities of two different units. Those units obviously use uh, different stuff and resources and work accordingly to own schedules. Combining those schedules is not always an easy task, but it could be if all available data were shared and stored in one place. There are also some companies that uh, allow only uh, access to the six last months of data. Earlier data are in archives and no one can access them easily. Hence, it is more difficult to build reliable prediction models. However, the difficulty lies not only in available data, although everything starts here. The traditional machine learning methods are designed to handle one type of the only one type of data. So numbers only, text only, images only, and so on. Even combining two time series of different time length or with different data collection rates may be problematic. However, there is hope. And this hope is called data fusion. For me, data fusion is a framework, an assemble of techniques and tools for the joint analysis of data from multiple sources or modalities. It allows discovering information and knowledge not discoverable from individual sources. It aims at obtaining information of uh, greater quality or value, where the exact definition of greater quality or value will, will depend on the application. Of course, in the literature, you can encounter many other definitions, but this one is mine. So, when we talk about data fusion, we can distinguish three basic types, low-level, mid-level, and high-level data fusion. In low-level data fusion, we combine data as they are and let a prediction model find an outcome we are looking for. We are using this type of fusion on a daily basis. It's the way the human vision works. 
Our eyes are two sensors creating two data streams and our brain is fusing these uh, uh, two streams to create a um, three-dimensional model of the world. Low-level fusion is applied in Kinect cameras for observing 3D environments to create depth images of recorded scenes. Also, my colleagues from the Systems and Control Research team are using low-level fusion to create, for instance, three-dimensional images of the human heart. In the mid-level fusion, also known as feature fusion, we first extract features from uh, each of the data sources that represent the data in the meaningful way. Next, we combine, so fuse those features and build models based on the extracted features to calculate the desired outcome. In the high level fusion, also known as decision fusion, each of the data sources is first analyzed independently to get uh, to an outcome. And next, those outcomes are combined, for instance, through voting mechanisms or using a more complex aggregation function. Let's go back to our manufacturing company. We want to detect when to replace a drill in a drilling robot, and we have pictures of the drill, but also numerical information like the torque. So now we have several options to consider. We can apply low-level fusion, combine those data and create a model that can handle both types of data, or we can first uh, detect features from images and the torque time series, and then combine them in a single model. Or uh, as a third way, we first can analyze each of those data sources independently to get uh, a recommendation, and uh, next, fuse those recommendations. Knowing how to fuse the data is both uh, art and science. There are a rule of thumbs, but sometimes your intuition can point you to the right direction. Having a method that would always work would be worth millions. Naturally, our drilling robot is uh, not the only one. There are uh, other robots owned by different companies that probably compete with each other. So uh, could we combine those data to create be better, more reliable models? Yes, if only those companies would allow to uh, exchange the data. Of course uh, not, as then they may disclose too much information. But wait. There is another way. It is called federated learning. Federated learning is collaborative uh, learning without exchanging the original data of uh, the users. More precisely, it is a machine learning setting where multiple entities called clients collaborate in solving a machine learning problem. Each client's raw data is stored locally and never needs to leave its premises. Instead, the learning model parameters or partial results are exchanged and aggregated to achieve the learning objective. Federated learning allows to create better models than a single client could have based on its own data. Even though proposed only a few years ago, federated learning has gained a lot of attention. Despite a lot of research and progress, many issues and challenges are still being solved. For the expert, I will discuss a few technical details. To the members of the audience who are not in my domain, please uh, bear with me. I will pick up uh, with you in uh, three minutes. 
There are Uh, there are three types of uh, federated learning, horizontal, vertical, and hybrid. One of the issues of horizontal federated learning is the fact that every party should collect exactly the same uh, type of data in the same way. The goal is uh, relatively easy to ensure with uh, cross-device learning, as the de de device designer can embed the learning in the device and ensure that uh, the proper data are collected. It is much more difficult with cross-silo uh, learning when several organizations are combining forces to train a model based on their data, usually historic data. Take, for instance, hospitals. Even though they diagnose and provide treatments to their patients, they may store different data in hospital information system or just measure them in uh, a different way. Together with my colleagues from uh, Rzeszów and Poznań, we have developed a method that allows to create models while representing the uncertainty and missing data as intervals. For uh, operations on intervals, we have used the Moore's arithmetics. It turns out that this is a good solution. The models perform well, even with up to 30% of missing data in one fe uh, feature. To make the model robust, especially het for heterogeneous data, we have experimented uh, with different aggregation mechanisms beyond uh, weighted averaging. Fuzzy intervals, especially Choquet integrals, show good results. If you are interested in the technical details, please let me know. Another issue with machine learning models is uh, data drift. Data drift refers to the phenom phenomenon where the statistical properties of the data used to train a machine learning model change over time, leading to a decrease in the model's performance. This change can occur due to various factors, such as changes in population behavior, changes in data collection procedures, seasonality, just to name a few. For federated learning, this issue is even harder as data is distributed. It is more difficult to detect, except the decreasing model performance. Well, this is not completely true. My PhD student, Maurice, has developed a method to detect data drift in horizontal federated learning. This method is based on our federated fuzzy Siemens clustering and federated fuzzy Davis-Baldwin index evaluating the quality of the clustering. Early results are promising, although we need still to iron out some wrinkles. The last topic in this federated, uh, in this technical intermezzo concerns allocation of incentives in uh, federated learning. Here, together with uh, my PhD student, uh, Afsana, she, she is somewhere uh, here, um, we consider a vertical federated learning scenario when only one party is interested in certain uh, prediction. But other parties may have relevant uh, data for this prediction. Consider here, for instance, a telecom company collaborating, collaborating with a home entertainment provider and a local cafe. The telecom company is interested in predicting which customers are more likely to churn so that they can contact them in advance uh, with a special offer to make them stay. As you may know, the cost of getting a new customer is five times uh, higher than keeping an old one. But based on own data of this telecom company, the models may not have sufficient uh, quality. 
Let's then assume that this telecom company would make an agreement with a home entertainment provider and a local cafe to collaborate on this issue. Those two companies may not uh, be willing or can't share the original raw data, but with fed a vertical federated learning, they don't have to. It is sufficient to share, uh, share only knowledge hidden in a latent variable, impossible to interpret for humans. Naturally, for um, the home entertainment provider and the local cafe would like to be compensated for their efforts and the information they provide. But the question is, what is the value of the data of each collaborator? Probably the telecom company has a certain budget assigned for this purpose. So, how to divide that budget in a fair way? For this purpose, we are using Nucleolus, a concept from uh, game theory. Nucleolus aims at reducing the satisfaction of unhappiness expressed as the difference between the claims and the payoffs. In our approach, the claim of a party is expressed as the improvement uh, gained when the, this party joins the collaboration. In, co in comparison to the local model. Results from our experiments match with human intuition, and we will validate this model in a real-world use case with the tax office. Let's return uh, to the main storyline, to the non-experts. Non Thank you for your patience. As we have seen so far, there are many situations in which we want to fuse multiple data sources. This field of research has reached a certain level of maturity, but many refinements are still necessary. And uh, this is what we are working on. The field of data fusion is uh, reasonably understood. So we can make reasonable recommendations based on fused data in many situations. So now we can ask, are we there yet? Unfortunately, no for practice, since this is only half of the story. Fortunately for us researchers, since work is still to be done. Let me explain. Recommendations distilled from fused data need to be contextualized. Before turning a recommendation into a decision and implementing it, we need to understand how it was made and understand the consequences of implementing the decision. Decision can affect the whole spectrum of people, businesses' operations, and uh, may even cascade to other decisions. So, recommendations made by the AI-based systems need to be contextualized. Conte contextualization has two main aspects, the content of the recommendation and the receiver of the recommendation, the what and uh, the to whom. Let's first discuss the what. The recommendations need to fit various constraints from business, ethical, legal, regulatory, and uh, cultural per perspectives. Imagine uh, an AI-based system for human resource management that makes recommendations for a short list of candidates for a vacant position. If this system constructs a short list of candidates, purely based on available candidate data from several sources, consisting only Caucasian middle-aged men, this might be a good list from a pure business perspective, but it's not acceptable from the ethical, regulatory, and cultural perspective. For sure not in uh, the Netherlands. 
let's uh, discuss uh, to whom aspect. So let's look at the receiver of the recommendation. The recommendations need to be understandable so the receiver knows what to do. And often the receiver has to understand why he needs to do this. This is where we enter the field of explainable AI. Next, the recommendation needs to be executable. In other words, the receiver has to be able to implement this. This has consequences for the HR management system that we just discussed. The system should be able to provide explanations why certain candidates are included or excluded. This has been even implemented in European law in the GDPR regulations. HR management system should make recommendations that fit with the hiring process for a specific vacancy. If this process, um, if this is a process with a very tight deadline, a short list consisting of uh, candidates living on different continents may not be executable. Recommendation contextualization is the key concept for a new emerging field of research. I call this field data diffusion. This is quite an explored field yet, but essential for the application of data fusion in any practical scenario. There is some scattered research here and there with some ad hoc contributions but a structured framework is still lacking. I want to make it uh, my task with my team to fill uh, this void. To perform the contextualization in uh, all its perspective, a collaboration with experts from those per uh, perspectives is crucial. Therefore, I look forward to work with colleagues from the business, ethical, legal, regulatory, and cultural fields. So, we are uh, not yet there, but I have taken some uh, first steps with respect to the interaction of the AI system with the human decision making. This interaction I called to the to whom aspect before. The first steps involve the use of natural language in this interaction. I believe that this interaction between the machines and human decision making can happen on one of two levels, the description level and the decision level. The description level focuses on capturing the essence of data. Many pe uh, so people capture the word with perceptions, the use of words, um, they use words to describe them. Machines, on the other hand, store data as numbers. Words or expressions, for instance, nice day, have some assigned meaning. This meaning can be different for, uh, to, uh, for each person, is context dependent, and may not be precise. I model the meaning of words using fuzzy sets. Fuzzy sets are used in the linguistic summarization techniques to automatically generate natural language-like sentences from the data. I, I am working on improving those techniques with several students. Using this, people and machines can share their understanding about data. Being able to discuss uh, the data is the intelligent interaction in its basic form. The decision level focuses on supporting user in decision making and uh, understanding uh, why certain recommendations are made. People, when making decisions, use their perceptions about the world, their knowledge and intuition. 
Very often they discuss uh, the case, exchanging the weight and waiting uh, the arguments for each alternative. Machines, on the other hand, they use available data, decision models, and patterns discovered from historical data. However, in many models, those patterns can be very complex and uh, embedded in the models. So understanding the reasoning behind a certain uh, decision can be difficult. Users can uh, only accept or re reject such recommendation. No discussion is possible. Nowadays, with XAI methods, a model can give an additional explanation on uh, why a certain decision is recommended. We need to go one step further, though. Besides explaining a decision, machines could incorporate arguments and reasoning in the decision model. This allows having a discussion with the machine and closing the loop of shared decision making. This is intelligent interaction in uh, its advanced form. With some collaborators, we are also working uh, on this aspect. The context is extremely important for the decision making. Let me spend uh, a second short technical intermezzo for the experts on modeling the dynamic context. Again, with the apologies uh, to the non-experts. Bear with me for two minutes uh, this time. Context is uh, a very important concept for knowledge-intensive processes. So processes that require very specific uh, process knowledge, typically human expert knowledge. These processes are hard to predict and vary in uh, almost every instance. Context can affect how the business processes are executed and how the goals of the processes are reached. This context can change during execution of the process. For instance, diagnosing a patient is a knowledge intensive process. A doctor's hypothesis serves as a context. The, text, uh, the test results can uh, contradict a certain uh, diagnosis, forcing the doctor to come with a new one, and thus change uh, the context. Together with my PhD student Zeynep, we integrate modeling of business uh, processes with goals and dynamic context. Moreover, we develop methods and techniques that can guide knowledge workers in task prioritization and goal achievement. Let's go back to the main storyline. Story for the non-experts, thank you again for your patience. So far, I have discussed the importance uh, of fusion and the importance of uh, diffusion. These two topics are strongly related. To reach real applications, the one cannot exist without the other one. Therefore, I have combined them into one model that is the basis for my research vis vision. I call this the hourglass model. AI-driven recommendations are in the center of my model. They are fed by fused data generated by the applications of methods, techniques, and tools from the field of data fusion. They are used as the basis for the contextualized decisions that are the result of intelligent interaction between the machines and the human decision makers. All of this, as the model shows, will take place in a larger context. Decisions take place in a business or a social context and hence steer the execution of actions and processes. This in turn generate new data 
that are stored in a multitude of information systems. These systems provide the data for the data fusion. This closes the circle of eternal data processing. You may have heard about a well-known plan, do, check, uh, act cycle, but here I propose fuse, diffuse, decide, act cycle. To realize this vision, I focus my research on uh, three uh, interrelated research lines. One focusing on fusion and two on diffusion, since diffusion is still a much more open field, as we have seen uh, before. The first research line is about information and data fusion. With the data stored in multiple sources, there is a need for techniques and methods integrating those heterogeneous data as well as analyzing data with complex and non-standard structures. The second research line is about supporting interaction between machines and uh, humans for joint decision make, uh, making. Hence, this uh, enables having a discussion with the machine for the best decision making. The third research line is about uh, decision contextualization. In the intelligent interaction framework, decisions are diffused along uh, multiple dimensions, which are related to different objectives. Therefore, uh, reaching the right decisions involves multi-criteria decision making. However, the challenge is that many applications, um, in many applications, the data dimensions do not match the decision criteria. These topics will be addressed in several uh, ongoing and future projects. One of the future projects is collaboration with the Dutch police on uh, cybercrime. Please raise your hand if you have never received an scamming email or a phone call. Well, I see no hands. Uh, this doesn't surprise me. In uh, 2001, nearly two and a half million people in the Netherlands said they have fallen a victim to cybercrime. Moreover, around 68% uh, of Dutch, all Dutch people say they have received at least one phone call, email or other message in the past 12 months. That was probably from a scammer. The digital means of communication enable criminals to commit more crimes, not necessarily restricted to geographic regions. This includes phishing, so stealing data used uh, via emails containing fraudulent links, phishing, stealing user data via voice communication, smishing, stealing user data via text messaging, and farming, stealing user data via website to which user is maliciously re redirected. In order to catch the criminals behind such crimes, the police needs to adapt their way of approach and use AI, machine learning techniques, to better analyze the available data, identify interesting patterns, classify the actors involved and prevent new crimes to happen. We will help the police to build better, uh, better relation network models of people, both victims and suspects, by combining and analyzing data from many different uh, formats. So the um, communication data, text, image, sounds, video, and so on. In, of course, in a secure privacy concerning way because security is extremely important for the police. Moreover, this analysis should not only be of black box type, but all outcomes should be delivered in an explainable way. In the field of uh, smart industry, we also work on applying the data fusion and diffusion frameworks. 
The, in industrial context, we see a huge increase in the amount of data being produced and a growing need to take uh, more and more complex decisions. The data is generated by the industrial Internet of Things, where almost anything can be measured. The number and the complexity of decisions to be taken is growing due to factors such as mass customization, just-in-time processing and globalization. Hence, this is a promising field for the application of fusion and diffusion. I have recently started uh, this line of research and the first results are uh, dripping in and we are working on ways to exp uh, expand this line of research, for instance, collaborating the, uh, with the process industry in Hamelot. A topic we are considering is uh, supporting intelligent decisions making in plastic recycling. I bring my research to a meta level by collaborating on the development of reference models, namely outcome economy model. The outcome economy is defined uh, by the ability to create value by delivering solutions to customers uh, that in turn lead to quantifiable results. We translated this concept of uh, outcome economy into um, a two-stage cyber, uh, cybernetic model that explicitly links the realization of customers' outcome to the provisioning of products or services by the producer, as you can see on the slide. Outcome economy model can guide businesses in deciding which models to develop based on which data. This is the fusion part, marked on the slide with green. The recommendations of the fused uh, model need to be diffused in the focal organization, so control um, so that control and better outcome for the customers can be realized. And this is marked in the purple color. And uh, one more, the last uh, of the future project uh, is uh, about, uh, let's say, fair AI models. So the models generated by the fusion methods and techniques can be biased. For instance, Amazon used AI-based recruitment system that prioritized um, men against women. Or an example closer to home, last summer it was revealed that Duo, the organization responsible uh, for distributing student finance, more often labeled students with migration background as fraudulent. This can have serious consequences. In collaboration with my colleagues from Brightlands Institute for a Smart Society in Herele, we are developing methods and techniques to detect whether the model is fair. Moreover, we will work on the methods for fitting recommendations to the various constraints, especially from ethical and regulatory perspectives. In short, we will work on the what aspect of the uh, diffusion in my hourglass model. These projects and ideas contribute to the realization of uh, different elements of my vision. Please stay tuned for future updates. So, I hope you can agree with me that the real value of uh, data is in fusion and diffusion. If not yet, we can discuss uh, this in a minute over a drink. Finally, I like to share my words of sincere thanks. 
First of all, I thank the Faculty of uh, Science and Engineering for their support and confidence in appointing me as professor in data fusion and intelligent interaction. I thank the members of the Structure Committee and ad ad Advisory Board. Next, I thank my family, uh, my parents and uh, my brother. Without them, I, would, I wouldn't be standing uh, today here. My father has passed, but I'm sure he's also with us. Uh, Mamo, tato, dziękuję wam za wszystko. Piotrze, dzięki za twój doping. Nadal pamiętam o zwojach. I also thank uh, my mentors. I consider them my scientific fathers. Uh, thanks go to my PhD supervisor, Professor Janusz Kacprzyk, whom I will always call the professor, and my postdoc mentors, the Jims. So Professor Jim Keller and Professor Jim Bezdek. Unfortunately, they cannot be here today with us uh, due to professional obligations. Anyway, thank you for your help and showing me that research should uh, be also fun. Next, I express my gratitude to all my present uh, and past colleagues and friends, especially of the Department of uh, Advanced Computing Sciences for their support. I have been uh, uh, and also this, uh, this colleague, so colleagues from the uh, Brightland Institute of Smart uh, Society. I have been honored uh, to work with uh, so many excellent uh, researchers uh, at this university and elsewhere, providing me with inspiration, new ideas and insights. It has been a privilege to supervise so many uh, outstanding bachelor's, master's and PhD students, as well as postdocs who explored all kinds of new research directions. Last uh, but not least, I would like to thank my partner, Paul, for his uh, love, patient, good advice and support in difficult times. Z nim mogę konie kraść. So if you do, uh, for you who don't speak Polish, met hem kan ik pardon stellen, dit uh, betekent dat hij mijn rots in de branding is. Thank you well om met my um, oh, thank you well om uh, my altijd bij te staan. I thank the audience for attending my inaugural lecture and enduring my speech. The real, uh, the real value of family, friends and colleagues is having a good audience. So thank you for being here. Dixie, ik heb gezegd, I have said, powiedziałam. Well, thank you very much uh, for what I think was, uh, was a very interesting and inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, I've heard a lot of uh, interesting new words, especially on the police uh, picture. Um, there were interesting drawing skills uh, that I will remember with, with the hourglass, uh, for instance, that also reminded me of the nice petals with all the information that you were dra drawing during the FTSE project. Um, and I guess there's more to come uh, like that. And, um, one thing I hope is that the, the fusion and the diffusion will not lead to more confusion. Um, so I guess it's time that we uh, um, will discuss soon over a drink uh, to prevent that from happening. Um, on behalf of Maastricht University, I'm uh, congratulating you, uh, Professor Wilbeek, and I'm wishing you um, the best of luck with, uh, with your chair uh, for the many years to come. And uh, we're really proud to have you on board uh, with us at Maastricht University. I would also like to uh, thank everybody here present uh, for joining us in this event and uh, invite you to uh, the reception. Uh, and please, uh, one, one word of advice for the reception, um, do not form a long queue. 
but spread out and uh, that's going to be much easier. You can already have a drink and, uh, and maybe a snack um, and then wait for a uh, good opportunity to, uh, to congratulate uh, Anna and her family. My congratulations are also for the family uh, who are here and uh, maybe for those who are joining from elsewhere. Um, and thank you all once again and hereby I close this academic ceremony. Thank you. <laughs>